Good morning again, and welcome to the Church of Christ on Fishinger Road. I'm glad that you've uh, returned for our second session of our mental health seminar. Um, our speaker, if any of you were not here uh, yesterday evening, is Dr. Ryan Fraser. He is a professor at Freed Hardeman University, currently in the Bible department, focusing on youth ministry, uh, but with many, many years in their clinical mental health field and uh, mental health department as well. Um, a personal private practice in counseling, uh, as well as uh, a vast array of experiences in uh, both mental health and working with teenagers specifically. Uh, this morning, the two topics that we're going to be diving into are teen anxiety and teen suicide. Uh, we'll take this first hour that we have, more or less, uh, and talking about teen anxiety. Uh, after Dr. Fraser's presentation, we'll have a brief uh, Q&A. Uh, there will be a microphone around, and so raise your hand if you have any questions about anxiety, and uh, we would love to have a, a bit of a back and forth between you and Dr. Fraser. Uh, we'll have a bit of a break in between then, and then we'll reconvene, uh, hopefully around 10 o'clock, for uh, the lecture on teen suicide. But as we begin, will you join me in prayer? Father God, thank you for today, for all the blessings that you give to us. Uh, we're thankful for this time that we have to uh, meet together, to discuss some important topics and uh, discuss the mental health of uh, Christians and to those in our lives who may not be Christians. Uh, ultimately, God, we are thankful for uh, all of the joy that you give us, all of the peace that you offer us. Uh, and as we look to this life, and especially the anxieties that come with it, uh, God, I pray that we can always turn to you first in any of those times and any of those feelings. Um, and when we still persist with those feelings, God, that we are prepared, we know what paths to take, we know who to talk to, uh, and we know what to do to get better. Uh, God, we're thankful for Dr. Fraser, and we pray a blessing on him in his, presenta in his presentation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. It is Saturday morning, and I'm glad that you're here. Hope you had a good night's rest. We certainly had some rain last night, and uh, driving back to the hotel, I was a little skittish, uh, literally, <laughs> with my, the vehicle, but uh, it was good to, good to have a good night's rest, and glad that you're here uh, today. I appreciate uh, Landon's kind introduction. I think the world of him and Haley, and uh, just I know they're a, a great blessing here. I can't believe they've been here for about five years. Time has has rolled on. I remember when uh, the first time I got to know Landon, he was the student government president at Freed, and uh, then I had him in class undergrad, and I've had him since in, in grad school and uh, got to spend a lot of time with he and Haley, his better half, and uh, did premarital counseling with them. I found out way too much about them in premarital counseling, <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we have a good relationship. Always love seeing Landon and Haley and now their children as well. And I uh, appreciate so much uh, Ron's work and uh, in in helping organize this and was the impetus for for this uh, seminar and uh, Patty and just for their family and all the families here at Fishing Road. I'm blessed to have my better half here this morning. This is Missy. Raise your hand, Missy. And so Missy um, is, uh, we've been married almost, almost 35 years uh, this summer. And uh, her background, she has a background in education and also mental health, too, and uh, served as a, a school counselor for several years, both in a, well, in public school, uh, in a high school in Jackson, Tennessee, and then in a low-income elementary um, school in, uh, in Chester County. And uh, Missy's got some stories, um, just some of the, the things she's seen with uh, children and some of the environments that they deal with. So I always appreciate having Missy with me. And um, a few years ago when I was writing Overcoming the Blues, I ran a lot of things by Missy, and she had a lot of good input in that, made the, the book just far better because of some of her uh, personal insight and also professional insight, and really appreciate her. 
So there's a story about this uh, guy that buys this, uh, this mule, and um, he buys it from a, a Christian um, individual, and he finds out that this mule only responds to statements. Um, so the one statement is to get the, the mule moving forward, if you're riding the mule, you have to say, praise God. And the mule would go on forward. And to get the the mule to stop, you'd have to say, amen. And the mule would stop. And so sure enough, um, this guy gets the mule and uh, his first time out is in this canyon area out in in Arizona. And he's going along with the mule and things are rocking along and the mule gets spooked by a snake and starts running really fast and he's coming towards this canyon and for the life of him the guy cannot remember what to say to get the mule to stop he's trying everything and you know nothing he can do to get it stop and finally he just says a prayer god please help me to know what to say to get this mule to stop amen and the mule stops right on the edge of the canyon the guy breathes a sigh of relief and he goes praise god that was the end of him. All right, so um, as we talk about uh, fear and anxiety, we, we know that there are different levels of fear and anxiety. And so I've got to be careful whenever I, I'm speaking either about depression or about anxiety because of the fact that there is a, a spectrum or a continuum. And um, so not to misconstrue things today, Um, I'm not today talking about everyday run-of-the-mill worry that everyone has in in the normal range, right? Everyone experiences that to to some degree. So that's on the the mild side, the normal worries and normal anxieties of day-to-day. I'm focusing more on moderate to severe anxiety that is more at a clinical level, and that's that's a different animal, all right? That, That has some interesting um, parts to it. So, for example, um, young people that deal with anxiety at a, at a clinical or more chronic level, um, they've reported to me that at times they, they are fearful or find themselves about to have a panic attack for no reason at all, all right? And they realize that it's irrational, that there's no reason for it, but because they're struggling with a disorder, it, um, it impacts them. And so, Like I said last night, the number one challenge, um, particularly in mental health, but I would think just in general, uh, the number one challenge that uh, young people are facing today is that of anxiety and all the pressures that they uh, find um, in their life and, and some of the struggles that are there. And so there's, there are fears in general among young people, the ones that I work with, the 12 to 18-year-olds, the 12 to 22-year-olds, I suppose, if I'm thinking about college students. Um, some of the areas involve just a fear of failure, that I'm going to fail, I'm not going to be able to uh, succeed in my um, high school or um, even get a good job one day, or I'm going to fail in relationships like my parents have who are, you know, maybe have gotten divorced or are struggling. There's also a fear of the future. And so what does the future hold academically, relationship-wise, career-wise? Uh, what about the, you know, the, the country? And of course, we are living in a day and age in America with inflation being so um, incredibly um, exponential that um, adults and young people are worried about what, what's this future going to look like? Also, future, thinking about eternal future, right? And um, uh, what is the end of the world going to look like? And what about heaven or hell? The fear of the unknown, uh, things that we don't know, can't expect, and then, of course, a fear of death. And so those are some basic fears or anxieties that a lot of people have, but are particularly uh, young people. And so in the Bible, we've got biblical encouragement. Over 300 times, some people have said 365 times, so I've not validated that, but 
But about 300 times in the Old and New Testament, it tells us to fear not or not be afraid. And I'm thankful for those texts. But oftentimes those texts within the church have been used to beat people over the head and to say, because you are fearing, because you are anxious, you're sinning. That is not the point of the text. The point of the text is to bring encouragement, to say God's got this. God is bigger than your biggest fear. God is going to see you through when he was talking to Joshua, to be strong and courageous as he was taken over from Moses and, and going to lead the Israelites into the promised land, uh, where Peter says, cast all your cares upon God because he cares for you. Matthew 6, that we'll look at in a moment in the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus is speaking about worry, not worrying about tomorrow, not worrying about food, clothing, shelter, because these things the Gentiles worry about, but God already knows what you need before you ask, uh, Jesus would say. And so several texts like that. And so these verses, again, not given with the purpose of chastising believers or um, scolding young people, but uh, rather to encourage us in our walk with God and to have a greater trust in Him. Oops. And so, fear is a common emotion that we, we often feel. We deal in fear in so many ways, and, and during those days of fear, we might feel unsettled, we may feel worried, we may feel anxious, and the solution, one of the, the great solutions is trusting in the Lord, putting, putting our burdens, casting our burdens on God, trusting in His words, trusting in His promises. And so, by way of outline uh, this morning, I would like to look at some statistics on anxiety. We'll look at some sources of fear and anxiety, some scriptures surrounding this that we can draw comfort from, symptoms, and then solutions all right, to this particular Issue. So let's start out with some stats on teenage anxiety, uh, particularly. First of all, young people ages 15 to 21 recently reported the worst mental health of any generation. And that's not, in, that's not just speaking about this present time period, this is speaking about all time in, in America. It appears that stress is uh, what, to blame the most, with about 91% of Gen Z respondents saying that they feel some sort of physical or emotional symptoms related to uh, stress, such as depression or anxiety. And Gen Z kids suffer from more mental health problems than any other generation of kids in American history. And so we're we're looking at young people that were born around 2004 or 5 and beyond, all right? Uh, millennials that precede um, are also uh, struggling. And so some of the sources of this fear and anxiety that is so prevalent these days include scoring high enough on tests to get into the right school, to get the right scholarship, to get the, the right type of uh, governmental supporting college, getting accepted into the right college, whatever the right college. Now, the right college is free to Hardeman, but uh, there are other schools out there, I realize. There's a little school over here called Ohio State. This is a small school I've heard about. Uh, receiving a scholarship is, um, is a big uh, concern. Bullying, cyberbullying, something that a lot of our young people are confronted with these days. School shootings. When I was a kid, I didn't worry about that. These days, kids go to school and they legitimately worry about that. Even recently here in Columbus, I was hearing yesterday about some concerns and some threats in a particular school. And so um, the difference these days is when something like that happens, how long does it take for the kids to find out that it's happened in some part of the country? It's instantaneous, right? on their social media feeds, instantaneous. And so, yes, there's some legitimate fear and concern around that. Smartphone technology addiction 
is another uh, source of anxiety invoking issues for young people. Uh, social media, whether it's TikTok or, um, uh, you know, they don't use Facebook as much, but Instagram or some of the other um, Snapchat, etc. Drug abuse, vaping has become a big issue. So the, the pressure to participate, and then also some of the substances that are being put in vapes these days that are addictive. All right, so, and there's several other anxieties. I didn't even mention family breakdown and uh, just things related to um, uh, concerns, you know, in, in their own personal relationships. But the Bible speaks a lot about anxiety. And I'm going to jump back here into Joshua 1, uh, 5 through 9. It says this, um, as God is uh, encouraging Joshua. It says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Can you imagine being Joshua? Talk about having some big shoes or big sandals to follow with Moses. Though Joshua had been Moses' um, protege for several, several years, they are wandering in the wilderness. Joshua now has uh, the non-enviable task of leading this people, this rebellious people across the Jordan into the promised land. And he is leading by conservative, by conservative estimates at least 2 million people, probably more upwards of 5 million. But going into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, but a land filled with giants. How did Joshua know? Well, he and Caleb had seen it with their own eyes as part of the, the 12 spies that had gone in some 40 years before. And so he has this massive task, and what does God say to him? He says, Several times, he says, be strong and courageous. Why does he tell Joshua this? Because Joshua was not feeling very strong and courageous. And he was needing that encouragement. He was needing that reminder that God was going to be with him, that this was God's battle and that God was going to bless him. You ever seen those, um, those license tag stickers or those stickers people put in the back of the car that says, uh, God is my co-pilot ridiculous? God is not my co-pilot. God is the pilot. I'm somewhere in the back holding on for dear life, right? Well, people will say things, I'm partnering with God in ministry. Ridiculous. We're not partnering with God in ministry. God's doing his work. We're participating in what God is doing. But so many times I think we, um, among Christendom, we'll say, we'd say too much. Now, we are God's children, but we're not God's partners. God is God. God is sovereign. We are his children. We are his offspring. We are his creation, and we belong to him. And Joshua needed to be reminded who was in control, who was sovereign. In Matthew 6, 7 through 8, Sermon on the Mount, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. What does that tell us about God? Well, God's omniscient. He's all-knowing. Not only is He all-knowing, He cares. In fact, He knows how many hairs we've got on our head. For some of us, it's easier to count than others by the looks of some of you. 
out here. But he has our hairs numbered. And he knows even when a single sparrow falls, because he cares so much about his creation. Going on later on in Matthew 6, it says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. God's love for us, his provision. We talk about providence, the providence of God. I like to pronounce it the providence the providence of God. God provides for his people in his plan and in the needs that we have from day to day. It goes on in verse 30. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you of you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Again, Jesus is not saying these words to chastise or to rebuke or to criticize those people that were following him. He's giving these words as a reminder of God's greatness, God's goodness, God's sovereignty. We can truly trust in the Lord and not have to lean on our own understanding. In Matthew 10, 29-31, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your Father. But even the hairs in your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. I love that text. God loves the sparrow. How much more does he love us? Philippians 4, 4 through 7, that we looked at last night briefly. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice that your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So focus on positive things. Romans 8, 38, 39. For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height or depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow, what what hope that brings to us as believers. 2 Timothy 1.7, God gave us the spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Oops. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have, for you said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. And then 1 Peter 5, 5 to 7. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Again, a verse given by Peter as a reminder of the hope that we have in Christ. And that's just a sampling. There's so many more scriptures in the Old and New Testament alike. Think about the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. With the young people... I often have them memorize scriptures like that, especially those dealing with anxiety, that they can meditate on, they can think about it. 
and that that can replace the other voices, the other thoughts, the other unwanted voices that are often permeating their minds. There's some symptoms of teen anxiety. Sleeplessness. It's common for teens to go to bed and attempt to fall asleep with their tablets, phones, laptops, while they're still displaying a glowing screen. And what happens? Well, they don't sleep very well. Many of them do not get REM sleep these days because if you've got glowing lights on a laptop or a tablet or a smartphone, they tend to confuse our, in, our body's internal cues and prevent deep sleep. It affects the circadian rhythms, our internal clocks. So young people and older people alike, turn your phone off. Turn the notifications off at night. Turn your tablet off so that you can actually get some good sleep. Teenagers actually need more sleep. Many people don't know this, but they actually need more sleep than those that are younger than they are. Um, and even those that are older, average eight solid hours of sleep per night. Nervousness and depression. FOMO, the fear of missing out. Kids are afraid they're going to miss out. I've got to, got to have every notification because I can't miss out on anything. FOBO, the fear of being offline. You ever seen a kid have their phone confiscated? They lose their minds. I've seen it happen in a school where a kid just went crazy with the principal trying to take their phone away. And so there's a, a real addiction to it. Many grow anxious. They suffer from withdrawal symptoms, um, like drug addicts when their phones are taken away. And so Instagram and Finstagram, which is fake Instagram, um, Snapchat, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook are ultimately not very helpful to your average person's mental health, unless you can really regulate yourself. Poor memories. Just ask Siri or Alexa. Kids don't have to memorize things as much as they used to. Just Google it, right? And so with mental overload, too much stimuli, constant distraction, it makes it difficult for kids to have the muscle memory or muscle power, memory capacity. And so exercise your mind. Now, during COVID, I made a blunder at Frieda Hardeman. I was teaching a counseling class, and it was around midterm, and it was terrible because everyone had masks on. I, to this day, I've got kids that come up to me at Frieda Hardeman, and I don't know who they are because I'd never seen their face that semester. And so they talk to me like they know me, and I, who are you? You know, uh, so that, that was difficult enough of being masked up. But halfway through the semester, I was talking to my college students in this counseling class about memorization, the power of memorization. And uh, I got caught up in the moment, all right? And so um, I said to them, you know, one of the things that I memorized when I was in about the fourth grade is the Jabberwocky from, uh, written by Lewis Carroll. It's part of Alice in Wonderland. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recite it for you quickly, all right, like I did in the class. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what happened with it. So, all right, so I'm going to do it in a Scottish accent, right? Because that's just the way I do it. Was brillig in the slidey toves, did gyre and gimble in the way, bow mimsy with the butter groves and the mome rats outgrave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch, beware the jib your bird and shun the frubious bender snatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, untimed the maxim foe he'd sought, then rested he by the tum tum tree and stood a while in thought. And while in uppish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came woofing through the tall wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through his vorpal blade went snicker snack. He left it dead, and with his head he went clumping back. Hast thou slain the jabberwock, my son? Come to my arms, my beamish boy, your frabous day kalukale, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave, all mimsy were the butter groves and the momrass outgrave. Uh, that's a Jabberwock. So again, I memorized that in about third or fourth grade, all right, in school. So I told my college students, coming back to present time, or a few years ago, I said, I'll tell you what, guys, 
If you will memorize the Jabberwock and recite it in class, I will not make you write another single paper in this class. You don't have to take the final. You have an automatic A. The moment that came out of my mouth, I went, what have I done? There was about 25 in the class. Every single one of them, except for two, memorized the Jabberwocky. Every single one of them. They had to recite it up in front, all right? And so they'd come to the front, and they'd recite it to the class. They all did it a little bit differently on different days throughout the semester. One of the girls in the class um, was one, one of our star pitchers on our softball team, Morgan Crawford. Uh, Morgan now is actually a SPED teacher, special ed teacher in northern um, Georgia. Well, she was one of the ones that recited it, and a phenomenal pitcher, right? Um, she took the, them, took the team to nationals and all this. So she comes to, back to class when they masked up. She says, Dr. Fraser, I want to tell you something. So she pulls me aside. She says, don't tell anybody. She said, but um, in our last softball game, she said, I pitched the whole game. The entire game, I was reciting the Jabberwock in my head. I went, you did what? She said, I was reciting the Jabberwock in my head the entire game. I said, Morgan, how did you do in the game? She said, I pitched a shutout. I said to her, look, tell your coach, but don't tell the other players, the other pitchers. I mean, she had discovered that through recite, it kept her calm. It kept her focused throughout the game. Incredible, right? About two or three months ago, Missy and I were driving through a drive through in, in Jackson, Tennessee, called the Green Frog, a good restaurant. And I kind of recognized somebody, but I wasn't sure if I knew this guy or not. I said, do I? I said, did you attend Frieda Hardeman? He said, yes. He said, I was in that personal counseling class three years ago during COVID. We were all masked up. He said, I still remember the Jabberwock. I said, how cool is that? With my clients that I work with that are dealing with different types of addictions, by the way, this is getting off track a little bit, but I think it's powerful. When we think about Hebrews 4.12, it says the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, able to penetrate soul and spirit, right? Dividing joint and marrow. It's powerful. So with my the addicts, especially pornography addicts that I work with, I have them memorize the entire book of James. They'll memorize 2.7 verses per day, about three verses a day, over a 40-day period. By the way, if you memorize 2.7 verses a day, you'll memorize the entire book of James in 40 days, all right? But by the time our, it's cumulative, so by the time I meet with them on the 40th day, they recite to me all five chapters of James. It's awesome. Because when you're trying to give up something, you've got to replace it. Remember that story about the, the guy with the demons? Jesus said, you, take a, you exercise a demon. If you don't replace it, it's going to come back with seven of his buddies, right? To, to reoccupy. And so having this replacement. By the way, once they're done with the book of James, I have to memorize the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. Once they're done with that, they memorize the book of Philippians, all four chapters. Once they're done with that, they memorize the book of Colossians, all four chapters. It's been the strongest antidote for addiction that I've ever seen in my life. I've done all sorts of things with it. I have clients come back years later and say, you know, the best, we did all sorts of things in counseling. The most powerful thing that we did by a country mile was memorizing Scripture, using that memory. After all, God tells us to, and David meditated on God's Word day and night, day and night. That's why he wasn't on his cell phone, King David. No, he just memorized Scripture. He was in God's Word, and we need to exercise our minds. Pretty awesome. Diminished attention span. The average teenager spends seven hours, 22 minutes on his phone daily and uh, doesn't 
can't often focus. So some solutions to teen anxiety. Solutions involve learning your triggers. What triggers anxiety? Just having that management, being aware, staying away from some of those triggers. Using spiritual disciplines, meditation, prayer, fasting. Fighting off cognitive distortions. So replacing it with good, clean, clear thinking. Naming your emotions. What am I feeling? Am I feeling anger? Why am I feeling it? What triggered it? How am I feeling threatened? Try paced breathing exercises. I'm going to do something with y'all for a moment. Um, we're going to do, there's several types, but um, I'll tell you what, we're going to do, I'll call it 4x4. Four four. The Marines actually use this to stay calm when they are in um, battle situations. And so what you do is you inhale through your nose for four seconds. So think of it like a box, all right? Four seconds inhale, four seconds hold your breath, four seconds exhale, four seconds hold it, four seconds inhale through your nose, four seconds hold it. You get the picture? So it's like a, you can even imagine like a lion going around a box while you're doing it. So we're gonna do it and um, sit upright for a moment. All right, and we're gonna inhale through our nose. So I'm just gonna do this. That means inhale, that means hold, that means exhale, that means hold. All right, so here we go, starting now. Okay. How do you feel? Calmer. What's really cool with breathing too is people can do it with a mantra. So there's an old prayer called the Jesus Prayer that the desert fathers and mothers in the fourth and fifth century used. It was Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And so it's a prayer. So while we're inhaling through the nose, we're going. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So that's done internally. Some people have taken scripture. Some of my clients have taken Philippians 4.13, for example. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So as long as there's four parts to it, and you can come up with a, a mantra like that to go with, with the breathing. Something else I want you to do just outside of mantras, just for a second, is breathing is, is, is powerful. In the Hebrew, the word for spirit is ruach in Hebrew. You know what that word also means? Breath. When God breathed into Adam the breath of life, he breathed spirit into him too, not just air, right? The breath of life, spirit. In uh, Greek, it's pneuma, pneuma is spirit. Pneuma can also mean breath or wind or air, right? Pneuma. And so, as we, we think about God's spirit, one of the first things people forget to do when they're anxious is what? They forget to breathe. They stop breathing. They start hyperventilating. And oftentimes, taking in shallow breaths and breathing out shallowly, or if they do breathe in deeply, they don't breathe out enough, right? Getting out the uh, toxins and uh, carbon dioxide, etc. right? Breathing that out. So 
remembering to, to breathe deeply. So what I want you to do is, we, we're not going to count this time, but I just want you, we're going to switch it a little bit. This is mindfulness. As we breathe this time, I want you just to feel the air. Pay attention to the sense of the temperature of the air going in to your lungs and coming out. Actually pay attention to what that feels like. All right, so take a, take a deep inhale. So we're feeling, we can feel the temperature, the odor of it, our, our olfactory sense, the smelling sense, we can smell, feel it going into our lungs. That's going to focus uh, a person that's going into an anxiety attack. Turn off social media notifications. I mentioned that already. See a counselor, that helps. Take medication, that also helps. Serve others. Take your mind off yourself. How can you serve? Great antidote for mental health difficulties. God knows that humans get anxious. That's why he's given us so much encouragement in the Bible. When we feel anxious, God promises us that he's near. Tells us we can trust him to take care of us. Of course, trusting God is easier said than done. And that uh, takes work. It's the path away from anxiety into trust requires a surrendering over and over to God. All right, so if you're looking for ways to deepen your trust in God, reading the Bible is so important. Read it often, memorize it, say it out loud, recite it to your spouse, to your parent, to your friend, to your minister. Incorporate it into your prayers. Pray through the scriptures. The Psalms are great to pray through. Don't fear, only believe. A couple of other things I want you to do. I want you to stand up with me for just a moment, then we'll take uh, some questions and answers. Okay, so mindfulness types of things, and this Christian, it's not just a Buddhist approach, right? Mindfulness exercises can in include balance. I've had some people that, this might sound odd, especially in an auditorium where it's sanctuary right now, some of the times they feel the most anxious is during the invitation song. These are people that are baptized believers and are in a good relationship with the Lord, but because of their anxiety disorder, it evokes this incredible anxiety and they just want to run out the back doors. So what I've had them do is use balance. All right, so I'm gonna have you, don't lift your leg up, just lift it up about a couple of millimeters and try to, try to stand upright so it looks like you're not standing on one leg, all right? So, Isaac, you, you with me? All right, so just lift up one foot. We do tend to lean a little bit, but you're looking pretty straight. Just hold it up. Everyone doing it? Serenity, you got it going on back there? Reagan, you got it? I'll see you guys. All right, put it down, switch feet. I'd like to see people's bodies going to move the other way. Okay. All right. So Isaac, what were you thinking about while we were doing that? Not falling over? Serenity, what were you thinking about? You don't know? If you did know, what would you say? You still would say, I don't know. Reagan? That you can't see me, but you can hear my voice? Okay. It's really hard, like Isaac said, it's really hard to think about anything else except for balance. All right, so it's a, a kind of, when people are going out of their minds, they're going out, they're losing their minds, it brings them back into their mind by using a balance exercise. Even standing beside a wall and putting your hand up to the wall about an inch apart and lifting your one foot and try not to touch the wall. And so I'll do that and switch legs, all right? So balance is a, a great tool. Take a seat for a second. We're going to do one more thing. We're going to use our... We're going to use our auditory sense for a moment. And so I like to use five senses. God's given us his five senses. Some of you that are parents has given you a sixth sense, right? But we're about the five senses. So just with hearing. So we're going to take about a minute, about 60 seconds. And for 60 seconds, 
I want you to listen for three things. Number one, I want you to listen to your own body. Maybe your stomach rumbling or whatever it is, or your breathing, listen to your heart beating. So listen to your own body. The second thing I want you to listen to is inside this room, anything you can hear inside this space, these four walls. And the third thing I want you to listen to is what's taking place outside this building, what you can hear outside this building. With me? So listen to your body, then this room, and then what's outside this building. Take about 20 seconds on each of those things. You can close your eyes. Um, let's see. Elder in the back of the red chair. What's your name again? Steve. I'm going to call on you in a, in a moment, Steve, to tell me what you heard. All right. How's your hearing? Is it pretty good? Question? I'm not going to ask her. <laughs> all right. I'm going to pick on you. I'm going to pick on Ron as well. All right. Up here, another elder. So we'll, we'll see what we, what we got. So close your eyes. 20 seconds. Listen to your body. 20 seconds. Listen to the room. 20 seconds. Listen outside. So there you go. Okay. By the way, when we pray, prayer is as much about listening as it is speaking. All right. Steve, what are some things you heard? Good. Well done. A plus. Run. Okay. Good. You find yourself getting anxious sometimes, especially if you deal with an anxiety disorder, or you have a young person that does. Let them use their auditory sense and just listen for about a minute. It again recenters, refocuses that young person. All right, y'all have done good. We're gonna switch gears. We started a little late, so we're running a little bit behind, but we're gonna get it rolling. Come on up here. Or do you want to take the break first? Uh, we'll do a couple minutes of Q and A, and then okay. have a quick break after. All right. Question in the back. Along with the hearing exercise we just did, I've also heard that, you know, using all five senses, mm -hmm. um, can you talk yeah, about that? A yes, bit? yeah, and typically, I, typically I'll do that, right? So we'll normally start with uh, visual, so I'll have folks pick a spot, pick something in the room and describe it, what it looks like, what, you know, so take a, a few minutes, or whether it's a speaker up there or something, the flower arrangements are focused on that. So using visual, um, and then using auditory, like like we did for a moment, and then using tactile sense. So whether it's feeling the, the the seam on your pants, or some people have those fidgets. At a client, I've got a fidget in my office, but some people bring their own little fidgets in. Then using um, olfactory sense, a so smell. I had one young lady that told me her. The smell that calmed her down the most was the smell of wet laundry. So I told her to hang out in the laundry room a lot. And she did. At her house, you're going every day. She loved doing the, doing the laundry. But just that smell was calming for her. So her olfactory or smell, sense of smell, and then sense of taste. And what are you tasting in your mouth? 
And so you can certainly walk through all of those in a couple of minutes. I just take a, take a little bit and that's uh, very helpful for calming, um, some, calming your nerves down and just refocusing. Thanks for giving me the chance to speak about that. Good. Uh, yeah. You talked about the teens and I guess the 90% number of Gen Z and what about adults? So what the, as this, you know, where we at today is our adult anxieties and depressions and things at an all time high, maybe, would, maybe not to the level of Gen Z's and such. And then secondly, maybe we don't have enough data yet. Would the young people, do they grow through it at some degree to where it's not either not either. I don't know if it goes away, but you know, or, or becomes less. Yes. Great question. All right. So statistics on adults, I don't have any recent stats, but I know what compounds that run. I, I would think for a lot of adults that are dealing with uh, tr childhood trauma things so later on that can come to the foreground where there was sexual abuse or some sort of abuse that's now been triggered later on in their 50s and 60s. I've seen some of that um, happen. So that would, I think that um, maybe would cloud or complicate some of the stats and just, you know, regular general anxiety disorder. Um, I am seeing, I am seeing, a, you know, quite a bit of anxiety. So anecdotally, I deal with it quite a lot with adults. Um, I see it more with the, with the younger population. Um, I think for a lot of a lot of adults, what what triggers that is going through a divorce, especially an unwanted divorce, things like that. But um, more adults, I think, are speaking about it because the, some of the stigma of going to a mental health professional or going to speak to, speak to a minister has subsided. But I'm, I'm also thinking about the previous you know, gen, couple generations ago, uh, my grandfather fought in World War II and some of the post-war war trauma and anxiety that came with that. So it's really, it's really difficult, I think, to compartmentalize all of that. As far as your second uh, question, which was on teenagers or young people, can they grow through it? Yes, if, if they've got a, a, a some sort of mental health disorder, they can certainly get to a point where, point where it's a lot more manageable. And they've got the tools and the skills like we're speaking about to, to offset it, to ameliorate it a little bit. But um, with, for example, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD does not go away. It becomes more, more workable. Bipolar does not go away. But it does become more, I think, especially on the right meds and um, the right uh, types of exercises and things that young people and older people alike can do, it can become much more manageable. Great question. You talked about, talked about memorizing scripture to overcome addiction. Did that include chemical addictions or just mental addictions? Thanks. <laughs> like alcoholism. Yeah, good question. Um, th to be honest, it's not a not a huge. You take a look at PET scans on a cocaine addict versus a um, an addict to pornography. Very similar. Brain scans are very similar. So behavioral addictions, just like chemical addictions, do trigger serotonin and dopamine pathways. The, product, product, the production or the lack thereof. And so, um, yeah, with, with, I use it with all types of addicts because what you, Romans 12 talks about the renewal of the mind. I take that both spiritually and lit, literature, literally that our mind can be rewired. And somebody that's got a, a behavioral addiction, it's, it's, it's wired their, their brain in a certain way and it's affecting their brain. That's why it takes more to get a fix to get a high, whether it's a behavioral type of thing or even a substance abuse. So um, th though there are some differences, there's a lot more similarity than people realize in even the impact on, on the neuro pathways. Um, my wife's gonna say something in a moment. Just let's go ahead and get this missing, we'll come back. 
Yes. I think I, ha I, think I have a couple of questions. Um, first, if someone's already in the anxiety, like they've already started their like anxiety attack, is your breathing technique still what you're going to if you're in person? And what if it they contact you and it's by phone? Yeah, I would, if, if they're with me, I, I breathe with them. And normally, you know, it depends on the person, but normally some sort of just touch. So I'll, you know, take them by the elbow, say, let's breathe together. We'll just do some focused breathing. Um, a lot of these approaches are more helpful on the front end, right? Or you, you feel that, this, that the panic attack or anxiety attack is coming on. Um, but, um, yeah, breathing can, can really help in the middle of it. Um, sometimes I think trying to do some cognitive things are difficult when you're in the middle of a panic attack because your brain is not, it's in a different place. But uh, it, it is useful. I think the tactile sense can be really useful in the middle of a, a panic attack to, to feel, you know, uh, feel a garment or feel the back of a pew or something like that just to, coupled with the breathing. Yeah. Other question? Was that it? What if you're on the phone with them? Oh, yeah. I'd breathe with them on the phone. I'd breathe with them on the phone. And I'd keep them on the phone and hopefully be, have another phone available to get somebody over to them. We'll talk, you know, about this different types of crisis um, management. But that's obviously more difficult on a telephone. Um, it's much, much easier when you're in person. And I'd say, okay, let's, let's talk through this and you've got to stay calm. It's really important if you're the caregiver, you've got to stay calm and not get worked up in the middle of it. And that's why people that are trained with doing crisis care of the telephone, they, they got, they've got to keep their heads about them. My wife had, I think, a comment or something. Hey, good morning. Um, of course, I was thinking about in school situations since I was oh, a yeah. school counselor for 20 years. Um, one thing that our students would do is breathing, but um, they would put their hands like underneath their chair and um, when they're breathing in, they'd pull up, you know, put your hands underneath the chair and then release, let your hands go. And they could do that in such a way that other people couldn't see it, you know, because there's, there's a big issue in schools about somebody's gonna notice or somebody's gonna be watching me or somebody's gonna put it on Instagram, you know, that kind of thing. So another um, thing that we would do is grounding. Do you talk about grounding I'm at not all? Not yet, no. Okay, um, all right, can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, grounding, I, where my office was in the school, there weren't windows around, so no one could see the students when they were with me. And um, so we would just walk out the door, and this I would use this during panic attacks with some of my teenagers, and I would say, um, okay, take your shoes off. And they go, I don't wanna take my shoes off. You know, and I go, it's okay, it'll work, take your shoes off. And um, they'd take their shoes off, reluctantly, like a teenager does. And then I'd say, okay, take your socks off. Okay, Miss Fraser, this is weird. <laughs> You're weird. We all know you're weird. And I'd say, it's okay, it'll work. And um, they'd take their socks off. And I'd say, what do you feel on your feet? And they'd say, it's cold. Or the grass feels prickly. Or it's hot outside. It's hot. The cement's hot. And um, so we would move through their senses, through the five senses with that. And um, it was a way to calm them and to, like we would say, get back into your body when you're out of your head. You want to get back into your body, and your body can tell you where you are when you're somewhere else. So use those five senses when you're grounding outside. And I'd say you can use that wherever you are. If you're, um, and you can do it privately. You could go in a bathroom and shut the door, although you might not want to take your socks all the way off, but uh, you will feel different just having your shoes off. 
but teaching children those private moments where no one can see them or is watching them. I think that helps a lot. Yeah, great, thank you. I knew I brought her here for a reason. That's great. Hey, on that note, and we're going to have more time for uh, conversation later, but I'm needing some coffee. I don't know about you, so why don't we take a little break right now? And is there coffee? Yes, there's coffee downstairs, and uh, we can take a break for about 10 minutes. And Fantastic. Let's take a break, and we'll come back. Thank you all. <laughs>